Good evening, everybody. Welcome to Food Glorious Food Adirondack Style, one in a series of programs co-sponsored by the Adirondack Experience, the Museum on Blue Mountain Lake, also known as ADKX, and Albany Public Library. I'm Meg Moore from Albany Public Library. And our first program was last week called Maple Sugaring Adirondack Style. If you missed it, we recorded it and it's now available for viewing on the ADKX website and will soon be posted on the Albany Public Library website. And in addition to tonight's program, uh, Cheryl Bronstein of ADKX recently put together this great program. It's scheduled for April 14th, that's two weeks from tonight, from 7 to 8 p.m. And I'm just going to read you a brief uh, description of it. It's called Adirondack Style Encore, A Taste of the ADK. Spending more time in your kitchen lately? Join us for an encore program in our Adirondack Style series, a cooking demonstration featuring faculty and students from the culinary and hospitality program at Paul Smith College, the College of the Adirondacks. This program will feature ingredients from local farms and locally produced foods. Chef Kevin McCarthy and the students will make venison medallions with a hard cider maple sauce, gratin of three Tucker's taters with Dutch knuckle cheese and thyme, and carrot puree, pea shoots, and glazed celery root. Uh, you can sign up to, for, to register for, either, for this program at either of our websites. If you look in the chat box at the very top, I entered the time and date, the or the time, date, and and title of the program for you, as well as the two others I'm going to mention in a minute. Um, and when you go to to register, you'll see in the description an ingredients list, so it'll tell you where Chef Kevin is getting all the ingredients from. The other two things coming up are aimed at children. Um, at the dates for these differ a little bit from Albany Public Library to the ADKX, but they're both on the same dates. April 15th, the, whole, the series is called Try This at Home. April 15th is Making Butter. And April 22nd is Balsam Traditions. And you can get the description for these on our website as well as sign up for them. And just be aware that the time that each program is on, it will be different for each website. So sign up for the one that you prefer. So back to tonight's program, there will be a question and answer time period. And so if you have any questions for Bethany, please put them in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. And tonight's presenter is Bethany Nyborg. She is in her final semester of the Applied History Master's Program at George Mason University. Her focus of study is U.S. history with a personal passion for food and fashion history. Last summer, she interned with, with ADKX and researched church cookbooks in the Adirondacks from the early 20th century. Um, if you go to the ADKX website and click on ADKX video series, you, you can watch video, videos of Bethany uh, making, cooking up recipes from one of the old cookbooks. So now let's welcome Bethany. Go for it, Bethany. Thank you, everyone, and welcome. Um, I hope to have a smooth technological evening this evening, but we shall see. So just me personally, I love food. I love to go on culinary adventures, both learning about food from other cultures as well as food from the past. I started this particular journey last summer while interning with Adirondack Experience. I got to see images of their amazing collection of menus from Adirondack hotels going back all the way to the 1880s. So at first, when I was with these menus, I was distracted by the ornate handwriting and the, the fancy French words that I would see. 
But I realized that amongst all those fancy words were base ingredients like potatoes, corn, beets, and turnips. So today, I will be talking about what travelers to the Adirondacks ate in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. And also how those foods differed from people who lived in the Adirondacks year round, but I will mainly be focusing on the hotel um, food. Tonight will be divided into two sections. Um, first, we'll, I will explore Adirondack hotel menus um, that lecture portion should take about 20 minutes. There will be a Q&A time at the end of the first half, so I'll be able to answer a couple questions. Uh, next, I will show you a common picnic lunch for vacationers and how to put one together yourself. So make sure to put any questions you have in the Q&A function on Zoom. All right, let's go to New York City in the late 19th century. So the middle classes at this time were now able to go on vacations like the upper classes and they wanted to get out of the city, out of the, the noise and the, the bad air. One of the most popular places to go was to the Adirondacks. The mountains had a lot to offer for the urbanite crowd. There was fresh air, clean water, beautiful views and good food. So people from New York City could reach the Adirondacks by train or they could take a combination of train and steamship. There were a range of accommodations to suit different budgets, but anyone who could take a vacation was already someone who had a little bit of extra money. In the 1890s, it took about 10 hours to reach Blue Mountain Lake from New York City. Travelers had the option to go by a sleeper car and arrive at the hotel before midday, or they could stop overnight and arrive in the morning. Other hotels would serve their most elaborate dinner at midday, although the breakfasts and suppers were nothing to sneeze at. This is the Prospect House dining room around 1890. Um, all of their best china is laid out. All the napkins are artfully folded, ready for this meal. And this would be a meal just for anyone over the age of 10. Anyone under 10 would have, would go and take their meals at in the nurse's dining room. Comparatively, this is an image from a supper at the same hotel. And it is a little bit less fancy. There's less place settings, but there was still good food, even in the supper. So what did people from New York City specifically expect to eat in the Adirondacks? By the 1870s, New York City had a large established restaurant scene and urbanites on vacation expected similar style food to what they were used to from city restaurants and hotels. So I'm gonna show you a menu from one of the most well-known New York City restaurants, the Monaco's. And this menu is in French and I only uh, translated the course headings for each one because that's mainly what I'm looking at here. The Monaco's was like the place to go in New York City. And the middle class could go there as well. They might not be able to afford a fancy private dining room or the uh, most expensive public dining rooms, but there were lunch counters and a less expensive public dining room that people could go and eat in at Delmonico's. So they would be used to, not used to, they would have experienced this type of atmosphere before. This is a menu from New York City. Um, MF Lions restaurant in New York City that is not a French restaurant. So you can see a little bit about what people would get if they went to a different restaurant. But it actually has a lot of the same course sections as Delmonico's. There's a lot of similarities between just how these menus were laid out in New York City. And I want you to note the uh, green turtle soup that they were cooking there. 
All right, let's get to the Adirondacks. This is a prospect house dinner, and I do not expect people to be able to read this whole menu right now, but it will be available on the recording. If you're interested, you'll be able to go back once it's uploaded and take your time looking through these menus and all the different things. But I just want to point out a couple of things here that it actually has a similar layout to the New York City menus. You start, it goes with soup and fish, and you have a roast and entrees, um, salad, pastry, dessert. This menu, I think, is particularly interesting as a historian because they've taken out sections of the menu uh, that were perhaps a little bit more English or American sections, like having cold dishes or relishes, vegetables. They've taken out those sections, and what they've ended up with is a more French menu, not just the fact that a lot of it's in French. Also note, they're serving a lot of alcohol here. Um, with each course, there's an alcohol paired to it. This next menu is also a high end, from a high end Adirondack hotel. And they were less interested in serving French food. There is the occasional French word in here, but you're also get things um, like, you know, you just have straight up roast beef, boiled potatoes, that kind of thing. And what I noticed between these two menus is that even though the dishes themselves are actually very different from each other, they actually use the same base ingredients. You still have like cauliflower and peas and potatoes and trout and lamb. So a lot of those things were actually the same. I found it interesting that this menu does not have alcohol on it. Uh, there is only one alcohol mentioned, claret wine in the desserts. It also, in the inclusion of the cold food section, is actually closer to what like a lady's lunchroom would look like in New York City rather than like a fancy dinner. And those ladies' lunchrooms also wouldn't serve alcohol. So I found that interesting in this menu that they had those pieces. Now, not all hotels were trying to emulate high-class food like uh, these last two were. Some simply could not afford expensive ingredients for a chef, but others like this hotel chose not to be fancy as part of a hunting lodge aesthetic. Their advertisement actually says, no attempt at French cookery will be made, which is pretty fun. Uh, they also say that fresh milk, eggs, et cetera, will be in profusion. They also have a very cute menu. This is a supper menu that they have from 1892. Now, remember, supper was a lighter meal than dinner. But at a lodge, like the Adirondack Lodge, people might not actually have their midday meal at the lodge. They might be out hunting or on a hiking trip or fishing, something like that. So they obviously put a lot of effort into this supper, even though there aren't any French dishes. Everything in brackets in the transcription is words that I could not make out. It's a little bit illegible, but I did the best I could uh, for you all here. I wanna point out that they were serving Saratoga chips uh, at the end of this meal, which those were made in New York, out, right outside the Adirondacks, started in the 1850s. Uh, and you can still get Saratoga chips today. So, yay, potato chips. So, with all of these foods, even though they're all so different, they actually do have a lot of things in common, which made me wonder, like, how did Adirondacks, how did Adirondack hotels actually get their food? And what I found out is that their perishable food was for the most part limited to what could be grown, raised, or hunted locally. It was just too expensive to have things shipped in. So we're gonna talk a little bit about agriculture in the Adirondacks. Uh, there were white settlers in the Adirondacks in the 18th century, and they all came to farm 
the land was actually viewed to have very high potential for farming because it was covered in trees, which was thought to uh, show that there was very fertile soil. So people were actually excited to go to the Adirondacks and start farming. But there's a much shorter growing season, it's cold, but they were able, the farmers were able to adapt. They planted lots of root vegetables, potatoes, you know, beets, anything that could be stored in a root cellar and stay good over the winter. They also grew lots of apples and dried them. And they raised cows, mostly for dairy, not for meat. It was mostly for the milk or the butter. They raised pigs for the pork, for the meat. They also had chickens for both meat and eggs and sheep, which were mostly for wool, but they would actually, but they would have, uh, they would eat meat from those as well. Almost everyone engaged in farming, even those who might work, be a wage worker at a hotel or log during the winter, those would be to supplement uh, their subsistence farming. These local farmers sometimes took in part-time boarders, summer or winter boarders, or own small hotels themselves. And the food that they would serve to their boarders was sometimes different than the food that the family consumed themselves. This is a quote from a book, The Wilderness Cure, and uh, this gentleman, Mark Cook, uh, stayed wintered at in the Adirondacks. Uh, he wrote his book to convince people who were um, suffering from things like tuberculosis to go to the Adirondacks and get healthier, but he has some great input into what people were eating. Um, he says that the diet of the people who live in the Adirondacks doesn't meet the needs of the consumptive patient. So they would serve, have a separate table for the people who were boarders versus the actual members of the family. And the things that he mentions, beef, mutton, chicken, wintering canned vegetables, eggs, bread, milk, like those aren't very fancy, but they do show some variety. And he's not paying the same amount he would if he had been to a very expensive hotel. So the hotels themselves, the local farms didn't produce enough food. They were mostly subsistence farmers. They didn't produce enough food to feed hundreds of guests. So these hotels would actually have their own farms to supply um, fresh vegetables, milk to their guests. And I would love to find out even more about these farms, but I was only able to find a little bit of information at my, uh, my internet only research right now. So only able to find out a little bit of information about it. I did find mention that the hotels would have uh, supply stores and they would sell uh, food and necessities, toiletries and stuff to the people staying at the hotel. They could also, you could purchase supplies if you were camping nearby or hotels sometimes had open camps where you'd actually be camping out on the property and you could go to the store at the hotel and you could buy stuff that was gotten from New York City and Cook says that it was overpriced um, or you could get stuff that was grown locally. And you could actually, there was, like I said, a lot of farms around um, especially close to where the hotels were. So you could actually go to a farm and buy straight eggs, milk, and butter from the local farmers. And Cook definitely recommends doing that over buying it from the hotel. This is a picture of the Prospect House Pharmacy. Prospect House is the uh, picture of the dining room you saw earlier, as well as the first Adirondack menu. So this is a view from their pharmacy. They would sell drugs. They also sold alcohol. They had flasks ready that they could fill with the alcohol of your choice that you that the men could take out on their hunting trips or whatnot. So the people who traveled to the Adirondacks, they didn't really come for the food, but the food was did play a part in the idea of the Adirondacks as a healthy place and a vacationer's paradise. Um, the fresh air at the Adirondacks was supposed to um, enliven one's appetite and everything was supposed to taste better there. And you know, the water was clean. So people really, even though it wasn't maybe the prime, it wasn't even the primary reason they went to the Adirondacks, it was still 
um, a big part of their experience there. So that's actually the uh, end of the first part of the lecture uh, that I'm going to do. This is just a, some sources that I found while doing my research. So I'll have a little bit of time to answer some questions. And then I will be able to go into the second part and we'll talk about picnicking. Um, so looking here at some questions, um, Gerald asked, what is a sweet head? As far as I can tell in that menu, I think it was referring to a type of cabbage or lettuce. Um, Someone else who transcribed that menu uh, translated it as, or transcribed it as sweet bread instead of sweet head, but I really think that it's supposed to be sweet head. So I think it was a, um, it was a, a cabbage croquette with peas is what that was. Um, someone asked if their, the hotels change their menu on a daily basis. Um, they tried to be as creative as they could with the available food that they had. Um, I haven't seen a range of menus of like every day in a week, so I can't tell exactly what they did on a daily basis, but I do know that they did try to provide variety, even though the, their choices of ingredients were very limited. Let's see. Um, locals would I have a question about locals working in the hotels. Uh, yes, they would work in the hotels. They would be uh, wage earners in the hotel. They would be um, in every part of the hotel service. Um, I'm just going to go through these questions until 7.30 and then we'll move on to the next part. So I'm sorry if I don't get to everybody's. Uh, none of the hotels, I have a question about if the hotels are still in existence. Um, the hotels that I talked about, they have all burned down or been torn down and aren't around anymore, which is really sad because while I was researching, I really wanted to go to some of these. Uh, it was made me sad, but no, they're, they're not around. Uh, we have a question about uh, the beef, where the beef would come from. So I, from the Wilderness Cure book, it says that all of the beef that's grown in the Adirondacks is tough and nasty, and it's not the fault of the people who live there, that it's just the, the climate, it's the place, but he doesn't recommend eating any beef that was grown in the Adirondacks. So this is just one person's opinion. Uh, but I imagine that having, you know, tasty, juicy beef was rather difficult there. Um, so they either made up for that in the cooking process, uh, or this person was lying and the beef was delicious, uh, or they had a uh, beef uh, shipped from New York City, which would be expensive, and it would take lots of ice and would be expensive, but it would be delicious. So um, we have a question about the waiters at Prospect House. Yes, in the images, um, there are black waiters there. Unfortunately, I don't personally have information about where they lived or uh, what their lives were like. Um, I know that there's some work that Adirondack Experience is going through to talk about the uh, black experience in the Adirondack. So maybe they would have more information than I do about that. See. Some of these questions I don't have the answer to. I wasn't able to find out, even though I tried. Um, I wanted to find out whether the chefs were being hired from outside of the Adirondacks or if they were um, locals. And I was not able to find that out uh, in the amount of time that I was preparing for this. But that would be very interesting to find out uh, where the chefs um, were. Uh, so uh, Cook, Mark Cook, 
I have a question about the wilderness cure book. Uh, Mark Cook is the author of the book, uh, The Wilderness Cure, which came out in the, I believe, the 1880s. And it's available for free on Happy Trust. If you search Wilderness Cure Cook on Happy Trust, you'll be able to read that book for free, which is awesome. I love Happy Trust, uh, if you're interested. Um, let's see, I think I have time for one more question. I'm sorry, this is kind of the all over the place. Uh, someone asked if people had choices on the menu or if everyone would be served each course. Um, it would be very difficult for one person to eat, you know, everything that was on those menus, but I couldn't find, again, any limited amount of time I had, doesn't mean the information isn't out there. I wasn't able to find out what the actual dining experience was as far as do you get to pick which pieces you want? You know, like, you have to have every course, were they families? or were they individual plates? Like I wasn't actually able to find out that information, unfortunately. Okay, uh, let's move on now. It's 7.30, so let's move on to talking about picnics. And I will be able to answer the, the questions I didn't get around to. I will be able to go through and um, send an answer to uh, everyone who I wasn't able to get there around answering their questions. I do hope to answer them all eventually. All right. So, but thank you all so much for your questions there. All right, let's talk about picnics. So picnics were the alternate option if you didn't want to have dinner at the hotel or travel somewhere else to have dinner, you could pack a lunch or uh, take the, buy the food from the hotel and go have a picnic yourself, which was a very popular option. Lots of people chose to take picnics at this time. Um, you could either prepare the picnic with all food that could be eaten immediately, or you could do what was also common, especially if there was a guide along, is you could actually light a fire when it was a uh, time. Uh, that reminds me, I need to turn this on. Sorry about that. You could actually light a fire, have your guide cook food for you there on your picnic lunch. Which would just be, it would be simple things. And if you went on a fishing trip, you could cook fish up for your picnics. Uh, this picture here, it appears to be winter, but they have like a very elaborate picnic spread out and what looks like uh, maybe a fire set up in the background. Uh, there's a, this fun article in the Adirondack Experience uh, collection that is a picnic basket that was actually owned by a hotel around 1900, and it's believed when it was donated, um, they were told that it was actually used to take people on picnics from this hotel. And I just love those cups. They're just so cute in all the compartments. Um, it's just so much fun. So we're going to actually unpack. I have a picnic basket for you all here, and we're going to unpack what uh, could have been in a picnic um, in the 19th, early 20th century Adirondacks. And this is uh, this is not a magazine-worthy picnic. I saw a magazine articles about picnics and all the fancy stuff that you could do, but the only description of an Adirondack picnic that I was able to find was actually rather simple. Um, so what we have sorry if this crinkles a little bit. Oh and my containers are not authentic. They're just you know what I had on hand. So of course you know the base of any picnic is usually going to be some bread. So you're just going to have some plain bread that you could actually you could bring jam to put it on. Although I hear that jam attracts lots of insects in the Adirondacks that so you might not want to do that. But you have butter that you can have with your bread. They would also have cheese. Was very common to have. This is some cake for dessert. Just a plain like pound cake was common at the time. To have a nice dessert. I've kind of prepped this as a like picnic for two that I might actually, uh, my husband and I might go out and, and have a picnic tomorrow. Um, this is 
nice good old slice of ham, which was very common for a Adirondack picnic lunch. And you could either eat this, people would either eat this cold or they would fry it up over the fire and have fried ham. Sorry, I chose very crinkly wrappers for all of those. These are hard boiled eggs. A lot of these are actually picnic things that you would find today. I don't feel as bad about just bringing bread and hard boiled eggs on a picnic anymore because, you know, it, it's got historic precedent. It's not me being lazy. And finally, the most looked forward to part of a picnic is the hot chocolate. So I'm going to be making some hot chocolate they would bring. This is uh, two ounces of grated unsweetened baking chocolate. And I've started some water heating up. So they would heat some water over the fire and they would have their chocolate handy. They would bring some sugar and some of that wonderful Adirondack milk. Now this is not Adirondack milk. I don't actually live in New York, um, but I got the closest that I could find. It's supposed to be very delicious. Uh, Cook, Mark Cook, highly recommends the milk in the Adirondacks. He said that there's more cream in a square inch of Adirondack milk than there is in a square mile of New York City milk. So I don't think he liked New York City milk very much. But what, while we're waiting for the water to boil, which it is almost boiling and it's actually really quick. I was surprised by how easy it is to make hot chocolate because I'm used to just, you know, dumping the powdered stuff in some water, maybe tossing in some milk. But it's actually, it's actually pretty easy. And I look forward to doing it maybe over a campfire this summer. That would be fun. So I got this recipe actually from the book Camp Cookery by uh, Maria Parloa in 1878. Uh, she, sorry, I gotta add these ingredients together. All right, so her instructions say to boil two pints of water, and then you take some of the boiling water and you add it on top of your grated chocolate. Like I said, this is uh, two ounces of grated chocolate. So she said to add it together, just a couple of tablespoonfuls to get the chocolate a little bit melted. Then you add it, just add it to your boiling water. And add in your sugar. Some of the camp cooking books I saw said to let people sweeten their own hot chocolate, but that was written um, so that was written a little bit later. So I'm just going to add a good bit of sugar to this. Stir it all together. And once it seems melted, I'm going to add my milk. Add my milk in. That's one pint of milk. Um, when this just barely starts to bubble up, the hot chocolate will be done and could be served. People could make sandwiches with the bread and the ham. Um, you know, take the sip of the hot chocolate. Uh, there's a lots of pictures of picnics in the Adirondack photo collection. Uh, some of them just look like they're having a grand old time. Uh, going out and picnicking. Uh, the weather where I am is just starting to get a little bit nicer, so I'm hoping to go out and uh, have my own picnic soon. So I have a little bit of time now that I'll be able to answer some more questions. 
ah, why are we cooking? Um, so in the advertisement for this, um, this program, I said that I would be preparing a dish from the time. Uh, so I wanted to show you all how you could maybe bring a little bit of the Adirondack vacation into your homes right now. Uh, but yeah, there's there's lots of uh, fun photos out there to look at. See. Still trying to figure out the Oh, what were meals like in private camps? So a lot of people, I found a lot more accounts of people writing about what they ate in, um, like if they were privately camping. If you're talking about like private great camps, um, those were, you know, they, they would have very fancy dishes there. They might also have, you know, they would serve a game as well in those. Um, that wasn't the focus of uh, my research for this one, for this program. So I do not know exactly what they had at the great camps. I'm just going over the questions here. Oh, uh, prices. I have a question. Uh, would the picnics have been spontaneous or more likely organized with a guide? Um, the, it's kind of hard to find like a account of, you know, this was my vacation to the Adirondacks. I'm sure that they're out there. I'd love to read them. Um, in the novel that I read, um, upset that was came out in, I think, 1902. It was called The Aristocrats. Um, and it was set in as a Adirondack hotel vacation. It was a very fun novel. Um, they planned their picnic ahead of time in that novel. Um, but you could also, you know, you can be spontaneous. Uh, just go and, and do things. I have a question about the prices at the hotels for the stay and the food. Uh, yeah, and the prices were uh, very greatly. So for Prospect House, um, I believe it said, oh gosh, numbers don't really stick in my head. It was $14. I don't remember if that, I think it was $14 a week for Prospect House. Um, there's advertisements, um, articles available online that say the prices of these hotels. Um, and it, yeah, anybody could go on a picnic. A lot of the images, you know, people who owned a photograph, it's the people who were at the hotels that we have a photograph. But yeah, people who lived on the farms, they would go on picnics. It was, it was a common thing to do. It was fun. You know, you might go out, you know, church groups might go out and have picnics. And it wasn't, this, it wasn't an activity just for the upper classes or the leisure classes. I have a question about whether people combine their picnics with hiking and boating. Yes, they usually would. You could um, you could do both. Uh, if you're boating, it's really convenient. You can pack more things in your hamper and have it on the boat. If you're hiking, um, especially if you're hiking with a guide, the guide would actually be the one carrying all the food for the picnic. Maybe some of the other guys in the uh, party would be carrying some of the stuff uh, they normally wouldn't ask the ladies to help carry the picnic stuff. But yeah, you could have a whole day excursion. Uh, the women would dress up in their mountain suits, which oh, I, I won't go down the, the buddy trail of uh, the, the clothing right now. Got to stay focused on food. Um, but yeah, especially and you could go on a fishing if you're going on a boating trip or even just going hiking. If you stopped and fished, if you caught trout, you could cook the trout as a uh, part of your lunch. People who went camping did that a lot. They would try to have, I saw one person who said that he had like trout at every meal. It's like, oh, I had the best trout for breakfast and I had you know, trout for lunch and uh, trout for dinner.
a uh, question about pancakes cooked by guides. Yes. Yeah, that, that was a thing. Uh, the guides were known for uh, cooking griddle cakes uh, for people. Uh, I saw it as uh, actually cook in the wilderness gear talks about having uh, griddle cakes as part of breakfast. Um, and I've read other accounts of uh, griddle cakes in the Adirondacks. Uh, breakfast. I did kind of focus on dinner when I was researching this, but there are menus for breakfasts in the Adirondack menu collection, which you can see images of online. Uh, so if you're interested more in breakfast food, um, you can uh, go and there's a couple breakfast menus, which is fun. See that lots of people are putting questions in the chat rather than the Q&A, and I might be missing missing some of the ones that are put in the chat. So I apologize for that. Um, okay, there was a question about when did the midday meal lose fashion? Um, so in New York City, the dinner hour would actually, it wouldn't be midday, it would be much later in the day. So it was actually something a little bit unusual about the Adirondack is that they had dinner at midday. It was usually that if the leisure class, if they had like a, um, a light breakfast when they wake up late and then they might have dinner between like maybe three and four and then supper would be something that they might not have until like 9 p.m. So the times of dinner have been in fluctuation a lot over the years. Uh, that's, yeah, that, that's a, a, a whole nother topic, topic about different classes ate at different times and had different big meals and smaller meals. And what, yeah, what became fashionable did change a lot with that. Trying to see if there's any questions I missed in the chat. Well, the directions for the hot chocolate did say to wait until the milk bubbled up and then turn it off. So hopefully that's what they meant. Oh, but I think this is ready. Although for me, maybe chocolate right before evening isn't such a good idea, but this looks yummy. See if there's any questions I missed. I tend to talk fast, so I'm sorry if we've ended a little bit early. Yeah, I think that that's all I have for you. I'm sorry we didn't go the whole hour, but I hope that you all enjoyed yourselves and I are going to uh, take advantage this upcoming summer of uh, getting to go out and hike and picnic and have lots of fun. Hi, everybody. I'm Cheryl Bronstein. I am the Director of Interpretation at the Adirondack Experience, and we're so glad that you in, um, joined us for this second in our Adirondack style series. I wanted to thank Bethany Nyborg. She um, provides a, a really tasty and enticing program for all of us and I can't wait to try that hot chocolate especially as I hear that the snow is beginning to fall. I also wanted to thank Meg Marr at the Albany Public Library and just a reminder that in two weeks you can join us for what will be specifically a cooking demonstration um, focused on local foods and locally produced foods in partnership with Paul Smith's College and more information on these programs, um, as well as the Try It At Home programs that Meg mentioned are available on both the Albany Public Library website, as well as the adkx.org website. We appreciate all of you joining in and thank you, Bethany, and hope everybody has a good evening. Thank you. Good night. <laughs>